night. Diolch agalon am y gwahoddiad i'r canol fan, diolch am drefnu popeth uh, angharad, a diolch am y cyflwyniad yn ôl an. Um, I will start this, sorry, I will start this po uh, talk with a trigger warning, for I myself was quite taken aback when I read the following passage from the text I will speak about today. Um, sorry. Um, you will... You see here the Latin original from the Institutione Femine Christiane by Juan Luis Vives, for which I will read the English translation by Charles Fantazzi. For many things are required of a man, wisdom, eloquence, knowledge of political affairs, talent, memory, some trade to live by, justice, liberality, magnanimity, and other qualities, which it would take a long time to rehearse. If some of these are lacking, he seems to have less blame as long as some are present. But in a woman, no one requires eloquence or talent or wisdom or skills or administration of the Republic or justice or generosity. No one asks anything of her but just chastity. If that one thing is missing, it is as if all were lacking in a man. In a woman, chastity is the equivalent of all virtues. This statement can be easily interpreted as misogynist, and yet uh, Juan Luis Vives, the author of the text, um, has been often referred as to as a pro-feminist. Uh, for example, in appraisals such as, I quote from Motley, um, when we speak of the feminism which begins in the Renaissance, it is largely of such educators as Vives that we are thinking, end of quote. I will leave the exciting questions belonging to gender studies that might be answers, answered by studying the Welsh text and its sources to a later stage of my study. So this was honestly just a teaser to introduce you to this yet understudied text. As the title of my work, of my uh, talk shows, um, the text is found only in one manuscript, Abreswith National Library of Wales, Peniarth 403, and remains unpublished, the two exceptions uh, being a fragment of the prologue uh, by the translator published by Garfield H. Hughes in Raga Madrosian in uh, 1951, and a chapter Pentiada Athrushat Merchet in the first volume of the anthology Rezyaith Gemraik, dedicated to manuscripts and published 1954. Important research on the text has been carried out by uh, Garfield H. Hughes and also by Branwen Helleth Jarvis, Nay Morgan, and I'm grateful to her, and also to Ankarat Price and Gerrit Wintler Morgan, who helped me with their generous advice to start seeing a framework within which this text can be analyzed. Needless to say, all the mistakes that might or will appear during this talk are mine alone. Uh, this is a very much uh, a report on work in progress or even at some points a declaration of intentions. Also due to the fact that I've started an exciting new job uh, less than three weeks ago. So um, it also should be said that for me, this whole enterprise as a venture completely out of my comfort zone for two reasons. Um, a, I'm much more used to the medieval Welsh text and this text belongs to the early modern period. And secondly, my comfort zone is rather Welsh linguistics, whereas this a study goes into paleography, philology, and cultural studies. Uh, so I will shamelessly use this invitation to speak today as an opportunity to raise some questions and look forward very much to get some answers and also new questions from this audience. The research was uh, is undertaken within the scope of a project um, Early Modern Cultures of Translation in Wales, Innovations and Continuities, uh, co-led by Professor Eric Popham, Marburg University, and myself. And this is a sequel to the first project from the same team, 
uh, strategy, the Welsh contributions to the cultures of translation in the early um, modern period, strategies of translating into Welsh in the 16th century. Uh, both projects are part of the DFG priority program, early modern translation cultures. And the aim of project in this first phase, phase was a systemic and text-based survey and contextualization of the culture of translation in the long 16th century, spanning the period before and after the Acts of Union and the Reformation, respectively. And the aim of the project in the second phase are is establishing regional specifics, region and period specific features of translation and translating, uh, global connections with Protestantism, Counter-Reformation and Humanism. And within this project, I am responsible for two foci. One are the Welsh Catechisms of the 16th century, on which I will say nothing today. And the second is an analysis of the Welsh translation, the Institutione Femine Christiane by Juan Luis Vives. On the whole, my study of the text encompasses the following stages, a transcription of the 128 pages of the text from uh, Peniath 403, um, its linguistic annotation, linguistic analysis, contextualization. Uh, I intend to make an addition and uh, with commentaries. Um, it also encompasses uh, the study of humanistic networks presented in this work. I hope to answer also some questions belonging to the field of gender studies. And I also think that this text with its um, well, with its contents makes it an interesting case for public outreach, which I hope also to do in form of uh, lectures uh, for the general, more general public. So, um, or in some other form. Um, today I will give a background information on the Latin text and its author, uh, on the Welsh text, its translators and its scribe. Then I will come to some stages of my study you see here, uh, address the examples that help us to establish the sources of for the translation, and well, then hopefully we will discuss the question raised. Um, the figure of Juan Luis Vives is, uh, belongs to the upper ranks of the brilliant Renaissance humanism. His name being mentioned next to those of Erasmus of Rotterdam or Thomas More, with both of whom he was closely connected. The Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy it gives the following information on him. Owing to the perturbed state of Europe, Vivas lived in many places, including Paris and Oxford. Although often based in Bruges, he edited Augustine's City of God and wrote widely on educational matters, producing, among other things, a highly popular teaching manual for Latin. De Animate Vita of the Soul and Life, uh, published in 1538, is an early empirical study of emotions, of the emotions. And this is how he he's presented as a notable humanism. For example, uh, in a short article on our text by Garfield H. Hughes, as a Spaniard looking back in Hiraith at his beloved homeland, plagued by the same feeling as Griffith Robert, feeling nostalgic about his native Wales. And the biography Garfield H. Hughes expands before us is that of a Spanish person closely connected with the matters of the Spanish court. Um, and I will just abbreviate and translate Hughes' account here. So Vivas was born in Valencia in 1492 in a great year for the history of Spain, 
when Granada surrendered to the armies of Ferdinand and Isabella and America was discovered in the name of the king and the queen. The royal court was in many respects praiseworthy uh, for its time and Isabella was a patron of Renaissance learning. Her daughter Catherine of Argon, the first wife of Henry VIII, was equally well educated and admired for that in Terralia by uh, Rasmus. And thus it was natural that she extended her welcome to her countryman in his need while he was in Louvain after stages, uh, stations in Paris and Bruges. So Vivas came uh, 1523 to England, enjoyed the Oxford scholarship and delights of the royal court and Munhai school he came to England uh, with a ready text, the uh, Institutione Femme Christiane, dedicated to the Queen and clearly aimed at the education of Princess Mary. And then, as the divorce of the King came on Catherine of Argonne, she turned to her countryman. And according to some accounts, he opposed to stand up for the queen openly in the court, but as a counselor to her, he was imprisoned for about six weeks. And after he left England and went again to Bruges, where he produced further works. This is a true account, but it lacks some important biographical information which first emerged in the 1940s and gradually gained importance in the scholarship of Vives. As the authors of a magnificent introduction to the uh, edition of, introduction, sorry, uh, to the edition of uh, the English translation published 2002 suggest, I quote, the context of, for the instruction uh, may be reflected in the work itself in the author's motivation for writing it and its tortured tone and its problematic content. And the context in question is the fact that Vivas was born in a family of converses, Jewish converts to Christianity, a group that was undergoing a terrible oppression at the time. I owe an explanation for this image. I wanted to have a rather neutral image while talking about the horrible fate of Vivas' family. And um, we happen to have this print in our household, which represents a feature that will be mentioned in this account, so hence the image. The father of Juan Luis Vives, an orphan son of a converso, was prosecuted in 1477, before Juan Luis uh, was born, for uh, secretly practicing Judaism. His future wife and Juan Luis's mother, uh, Blanquina March, had been summoned uh, at the age of 14 before the tribunal, where she proved her faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. In uh, 1491, she testified that, urged by her mother, she had twice celebrated Yom Kippur, but had discontinued the practice, wishing to live and die like a Christian. In uh, 1500, when Juan Luis was eight years old, his family was charged again, um, attending a clandestine synagogue, allegedly led by his cousin, Miguel, as a rabbi, and the cousin and his mother were burnt to death the following year. In 1505, his great-grandfather was burned and his ashes were scattered in public dump. 1508, his mother died of plague and uh, then uh, Juan, Luis, uh, Juan Luis left for Paris in 1522, about the time when Vives is, was writing the Instruzione, he learned that his father was against arrested back in Spain for an Inquisition trial, which lasted for two years and resulted in an execution together with his mother, uh, the grandmother of, of Juan Luis Vives, uh, the Esperanza, and other relatives, he was burnt to death. And then in 1528, the body of Vives's mother, buried for 20 years, was exhumed and publicly burnt. In the middle of this image 
you can see people carrying coffins. These are the remains of the heretics that have to be burned, even if they have died long ago. Hence, well, the presence of this, well, the, of this picture uh, showing us a, a different uh, inquisitional process. Uh, these circumstances, the editors of the English translation claim, possibly, uh, I quote, helped create the institution's severe and pessimistic tone. End of quote. And yet, as the same authors rightly argue, such biographical traces are less determinate and arguably less important than the diverse intellectual and formal influences on the treaties. The Institutione Femine Christiane is a conduct book consisting originally of the three parts. The first dedicated to girls before marriage, that is virgins. This part is the only one translated into Welsh. The second part is dedicated to married women and the marriage, and the third to widows. Heavily laced with quotations from patristic sources, it is rather peculiar in its tone. It swings often from a, again I quote, a gentle pragmatic counsel in the third person to second person accusations and invective. It has a rather pessimistic view of women, as you could have guessed from my first quotation. And although this work has been praised as program of education for women, it is important to emphasize that the main aim of the female education is to uphold chastity, and it discourages the study of eloquence for women who have, however, learned who have to be, however learned they are, to be confined to their homes and to silence. Whatever its expression its impression on the contemporary reader, this treatise turned out to be a huge success. Its, sec its first edition was published in uh, 1523 uh, in Antwerp, the English one in 1529, and by 1600, more than 40 editions existed. This list does not content in various languages, including Dutch, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. This list does not contain, contain the Welsh translation, which is found only in a manuscript, and I'm unaware of any other translations transmitted in manuscripts only, so maybe this list is longer. Beavis' instruction is located between two genres, the high medieval treatise on uh, on education, directed to parents of nobly born children, and the High Renaissance marriage tract, addressed primarily to middle class families. And it is this dual quality that must have made this text so popular after the high patron of Vivas, Catherine of Aragon, turned into disgrace. While the Latin text is dedicated to Catherine of Aragon, and um, who is at the time of writing it uh, an exemplar of all the virtues possible at her husband's court, the text continues to be interesting in 1529 when it's being translated into English uh, while Catherine is no longer the queen and transmitted further in Europe without the original political context. Of the Welsh translator, we know, as Garfield Hughes puts it, I enu gawn de my gyd. Here's the information on him from the Dictionary of the Welsh Biography. Uh, a Welshman who made a translation into Welsh, the Institutione Femine Christiane. Um, no particular cons particulars concerning the translator have been gathered. Um, um, we do know, however, much more about the scribe. Oh, sorry, I see I don't have the slides. So, uh, about the well, sorry, um, about the scribe to whom we owe the transmission of the text, Richard Langford or Longford. I'm sorry for the absence of the slide. Um, is referred to by Daniel Hughes in his 
repertory as antiquary and proto-humanist um, and provides and Daniel Hughes provides a long list of surviving manuscripts and Longford's hand testifying his interests in Welsh literature, law and history and uh, a quote from Hughes, uh, the desire to see learning made available in Welsh, which he shared with his close associate, the great William Salisbury. Penyard 403 is a collection of fragmentary manuscripts, mainly in Langford's hand, uh, and also that of his amanuensis X21. Apart from this Gediaith, it has sibilant prophecy and some pedigrees. Um, and now from this background information, I will turn to my own research. As I have said, the text has not been edited yet, and at the current stage, I'm transcribing it, still work in progress. Given the importance of Richard Longford as a um, scribe, and also in a hope for a shortcut for my own work, um, I hope to produce at the end not only a transcription, but also to enable a handwritten text recognition model to deal with further manuscripts of the scribe. And in order to do so, I'm using the platform Transcribus, uh, which provides options for artificial, artificial intelligence, power text recognition and transcription. To train my model, I use the passages transcribed by Garfield H. Hughes, but since it's not enough, I also add my own transcriptions. I'm not through with it yet, but my first results are quite promising so that I hope to get the model working in a sufficient way. Anyway, the tool is also very useful. I, I heartily recommend it, uh, even without ambitions to create a text recognition model, as it provides a user-friendly interface for transcription, marking for you the lines uh, you are at and having several useful options. And here comes an ad um, at the International Congress of Celtic Studies in Utrecht. Bernard Bauer, currently at the University of Graz, and myself hope to present a workshop in cooperation with Sarah Mansuti from the Read Coop team behind Transcribus. Uh, the workshop has the title Handwritten Text Recognition Meets Celtic Studies and Introduction to Transcribus. And we hope that we will attract more people to use this tool because, well, also because the more people use it and generate data in a specific language, that is in Welsh or in Irish, the more powerful the models will become. And I think that might be a promising path. As in the case of Our previous projects in Marburg, parts of the text will be morphologically and then syntactically annotated and will thus become part of the Parshkul. Here, my gratitude goes to David Willis uh, and Marie Kamelin for creating Parshkul, um, the parsed historical corpus of the Welsh language, to Marika for all her algorithms that enable us to do the annotation, and also to our wonderful colleague Rafael Zachman from the Marburg team for his patience and acute grammatical analysis in manually correcting the tags. The annotation allows us to answer some questions that would be much more difficult to be dealt with uh, without the annotation, such as what would order patterns, forms of relative clauses, uh, but also frequency of doublets, or if we add some annotation uh, information manually on the frequency of loan words. And here are a few examples of what can be done. Um, uh, Branwen Jarvis has commented that the Welsh translator uses English loanwords pretty often. And uh, here you see 
the data from our texts, the texts we have analyzed in our project on the book of the Anchorite of Slandewi Brevi, um, excerpts of them, uh, and also one, mostly 1,000 words excerpts, and also from the texts that are found in our 16th century project. And as you can see, we have um, we have some texts that have here. We first we have and we have annotated that with the information, etymological information given at the Giriadir Prevaskal Kamri. We have not um, conducted any etymological um, study ourselves. Uh, this is the from how how the Giriadir assesses it. And so here are the percentage of loanwords or hybrids, and you can see that the texts vary um, considerably. They also vary, well, the texts above the red line are the texts from the 13th century, uh, from the 14th century, sorry, the texts below are from the 16th century. We can see that there is a certain raise in, in the frequency uh, of loanwords, and some texts have definitely more. And it's even more, um, more interesting in the case of, um, well, of, of Latin loanwords. There is, a, of course, a huge problem of what we call a Latin loanword, and how do we distinguish between those borrowed directly from Latin or from English or from French? Um, I have try to deal with this problem. We can come back to that if there is an interest um, in the Q&A section. Um, so here are just those, well, briefly speaking, uh, those are the forms which are given the Latin as their first hypothesis on the borrowing by GPC. And here you can see that, so these are the percentage of Loan words that are annotated as those from Latin in GBC among the loan words. And um, as you can see, some of the texts, like the um, explanation on the Lord's Prayer in Ashlevaranka, has no other no other loan words than Latin. That is no loan words that would be. Uh, assessed as, well, again, the excerpts, there might be, of course, uh, there is a chance that the text at all would be different in that respect. Um, so there are no English nor French loanwords in that passages we have analyzed. Um, and on the whole, we don't come under, well, uh, it's it's absolutely the the long, Latin loan words are always the most frequent in all of the texts. In the 16th century, we have a huge vari the variation is much uh, higher. So there we have texts like homilies, the translation of homilies, or um, uh, definiat faith, which have a very high, still a very high percentage of Latin loanwords as opposed to those um, borrowed from English or French. And then uh, we have two texts which are remarkably uh, full of, of English translations. That is um, a part of a text uh, of by Robert Gwynn we have analyzed and that of uh, this Katie uh, translated from Vivas. Here we see that the number of English loanwords is almost as high as that of Latin. And by Latin, of course, we see the whole period of development of the British languages. So with all the um, loanwords which were borrowed um, back uh, in, in the beginning of the first uh, millennium. So um, by analyzing, by, by, by uh, 
analyzing the nouns. Oh, I should have said it. Sorry, I haven't um, declared the methodology too clearly. Uh, we have analyzed only the nouns here because we uh, we know that nouns are the loanwords which are borrowed most easily and they always constitute most of the part um, for um, borrowings. And by analyzing that, we can see that there is a certain there are certain tendencies in the language of the translations. Um, now turning to the text itself. Um, first, I will say a few words about the prologue. Uh, here again, I'm not ready with all of it, and it's awfully sad that some of its unique contents will be re never recovered due to the missing part of a page. But here, already from the parts that I have, interesting questions arise. First is the reference to the text's intended usage. And that is, well, in my translation, I'm, I'm looking if you have any suggestions for its corrections, um, where Richard Owen suggests that the text might be Darlen, that the girls should uh, ne urando i darlen, the text. That is, um, the text being read or hear it being read. And um, my question rather to this learned audience is whether we should take this utterance at its face value as an evidence of lacking reading knowledge uh, and also that the translator might have considered to make this text more accessible orally, or is it some kind of commonplace for the time of which I'm not aware of? Uh, another point is a list of uh, inspirational books the author introduces. And here we see him quoting um, Virgil, and Ovid, Ovid, by the way, he refuses, he denies the right to the women to read him. And he also speaks about um, an author he calls Marculius. So it's really Marculius, as you can see here, a poet Marculius. And I suggest that this stands uh, due to a misspelling for the late antique author Marcellus Empiricus, whose treatise De Medicamentis was, uh, was printed in Basel in 1536 by Janus Cornarius. And uh, De Medicamentis is a text on uh, Um, and 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 it is well. It is a um, sorry. Um, it is a medical text on the uh, sorry on plants on 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 plants. And so um, we know that Janus Canaris, who has printed the text, was uh, connected closely with Erasmus of Rotterdam, and we know that Erasmus is closely connected with Thomas More and Juan Vives, and we know that this text has been recepted in England. We have a um, figure uh, of a simple uh, of a simpleton called Marcellus in the Book of Simples uh, by William Bolain, and we know, so we know that this edition produced by Janos Canaris constitutes for the translator of uh, the Institutione an important reference point, which is an indication of tight connections between Welsh humanists and their English and continental contemporaries. I find it rather curious that neither Marcellus nor Janos Canaris are mentioned by William or used by William Salisbury in his According to Ewan Rhys Edgar, one of 
Salisbury's main sources, however, was the Historia Stirpium by Leonard Fuchs, another Basel-based uh, scholar of exactly the same time. And Leonard Fuchs was involved in a fiery feud with Janus Carnarius, who was published, who has published a series on invectives against him under the name of Orationis and Leonardum Fuxium Sive Fuxeides, um, under the name uh, titles such as Vulpecula Excoriata, etc., etc. So I'm looking forward uh, to discover other names and references in this Welsh book that might provide us with more information on the humanist networks, be it relationships full of admiration or that of hatred. And we'll now turn to the question of the source. Uh, if we, well, uh, Richard Owen definitely uh, states in the, on the first page of his translation, that he has translated this, uh, this text or Hlading from Latin. Uh, however, if one compare, starts to read the text and compare it with the Latin uh, original, um, some questions uh, start, start coming up. So here is uh, an interesting example from the uh, from a chapter on, on food. Uh, the fact that we have many um, English loanwords here, the ones I've mentioned already, like Capildiat, Patriciat, Fesantis, is not probably that important. We know that these words have been uh, borrowed already in the 15th century. That is what uh, Geriatr Prepascal tells us. However, um, and even Fesantes with its English um, ending, plural ending, is not that um, telling. However, when you look at the English translation, uh, we see that the Kevnes Saviate Tlotion, which are absent in the Latin texts, um, are there in the form of poor neighbors. So that is already suspected. And the examples are many. We have many omissions we find in Latin text, uh, we, we find in English text, like we have um, a number of, sorry, uh, we have tropacibus, sapunculis, et smegmatis in the Latin text, and we have only soapies, well, because there are too many. Uh, things which might be relevant in the English text, and that's exactly what we find in Welsh, only Sebon. Uh, we have also an interesting example where we have in Latin uh, the diction of arbitri, which is probably for the Latin, for the those reading in uh, Latin, obvious that it is about Petronius. In English, we have poete arbiter, where arbiter can be already probably taken as a personal name. Um, the question is whether uh, the translator understands that it is, um, well, not, not the personal name. And in the Welsh, we have it in the same form. Um, my an, an example I would like to uh, see uh, to, to discuss in detail is the following. Uh, Vivas is going strictly against reading the romance. He wants magistrates to prohibit publishing and reading it and everywhere because they are something which affects chastity for women dramatically. Women are not supposed to read that, but unfortunately they are really um, numerous all around Europe. So in Pestiferis um, Liberis, uh, in his book, uh, Vivas has a list of 
following lists of the countries and its books. Spanish books, uh, then we have French books, uh, books from Netherlands, and then yet another list from those translated, as he said, um, uh, from Latin. In the Welsh translation, we have, um, to which he erroneously uh, includes Bacacius uh, de Cameron. In the Welsh translation, we have also a list of Spanish bad books. We have a French list um, of Lancelot Le Lac uh, and Melusine. And we have an English, we have also um, and we have an English list of Parthenope, Generides, Hippomedon, uh, William Miller, Libius, Arthur, Guy and Bevis, texts which might be familiar to some of the audience. And then he also adds these texts translated from Latin, uh, Poggius, and, um, but not, not Boccaccio. This English list is somewhat uh, suspicious and yes we find it in the English translation. The English translations actually uh, has all the texts um, the Latin one has, um, so the Spanish list, the, uh, the French list and the uh, Netherlands list, which is the Netherlands list is absent as you see in the Welsh version, and uh, but it also adds uh, a local list for the English ones. So as you might have guessed, I suggest that the Welsh translation definitely has used the English translation. Um, the English translation was published about 1529. It was translated in the house of Thomas More by uh, Richard Hurd, who probably was um, either a surgeon or a tutor at Thomas More's house, teaching his numerous daughters. Um, he has translated all the three parts of the book uh, by the time when, as I said, Catherine of Aragon was no longer the queen, so it was a text translated for the merits of its educational part, not for its political part. And um, this is an uh, so it is definitely that the translator, the Welsh translator, has used this translation. Another question, and I'm not the first one, honestly, to to understand that. Um, Garfield H. Hughes also notices that, but he also suggests that the translator has used the Latin text. Of that, I have not found um, any evidence yet, but I'm looking forward to see that. Uh, this second-hand translation is nothing new for the time, and um, Eric Popper has recently uh, shown in, um, in his publication in print on uh, the Definite Faith that there is um, following Iris Plak, then there are two types of um, intermediate second-hand translations, Übersetzung uh, aus zweiter Hand, which depend on um, the use or use the translation of the source into another language. So there are an aneignung, which does not consult uh, the original, and then there is a contamination, the so-called contamination, where a translator both consults the original and the intermediary text. Um, and transparent form acknowledge um, the use of another translator and a pack ones don't. And we have both forms of it in Welsh. Um, Kiffin's Definiat Faith at Lois Ploiger, uh, sorry, Ploiger, um, does not uh, acknowledge the use of the Latin, uh, of the English intermediary translation, 
which is, however, obviously used, as Eric Poppe has shown. And on the other hand, uh, Perlman Advith clearly states that it uses the English translation by Miles Coverdale. Um, our Welsh translation of the Institutione Femine Christiane uh, belongs to the Aneignum, so the um, appropriate type of translation. And I'm really looking forward to see whether we shall see any traces of the Latin text there at all. Interestingly, the sum of mise en page uh, suggests that the English text was used, this shape form of, of the first page is, is there, but all the images uh, like one uh, with a baby here are definitely not have uh, don't have any uh, in, don't show any influence of the images from either Latin or the um, English uh, editions. So um, in what I've tried to go through uh, in this talk, I have. Um, hope to, to show you my work program of uh, transcription, linguistic annotation, uh, linguistic analysis, and following by an addition and commentary of this Welsh text. I hope to have shown that its contextualization, um, including the biographical information on Vivas, uh, might offer insights for better understanding of this pivotal work. I hope that this study will, at the end, contribute to our better understanding of humanistic networks, also answer some questions, more questions about uh, the gender studies, which the texts of the Welsh, uh, Welsh texts of this period might offer. And I also think that this text is a good example for public outreach. Thank you very much for your attention. Diochen Bauer, I'm Roy Grandawetan, yeah,